Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the founding of the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration. With me today to talk about the history of OSHA is a man who knows quite a bit about that. He spent 25 years as a state OSHA inspector. Today he has a safety consulting firm. He is Randy Gray from Benton, the son of our good friend J.R. Gray, our uh, Labor Secretary. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Barry. I teach history, but I'm going to turn this over to you and let you sketch out the history of OSHA. Going back to 1970, I would like to begin by saying, you know, you can really tell you're getting old when you remember historical events quite, quite vividly. So tell us about the history of OSHA to start with. All right, let me find my cane someplace. I believe <laughs> I feel like I've just dated myself. But, uh, well, really, Barry, the history of OSHA began a long, long time ago before we actually had the creation of OSHA. And that, what I'm referring to is, is we created the need for OSHA. Whenever we uh, came into the Industrial Revolution in the United States, we also, that, that came with a lot of problems with, uh, you know, safety hazards, oh, health absolutely. hazards, and different things. Right. And, and for many, many years from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution up till 1970, we had no real safety and health laws in place. And we had women and children and men being maimed, injured, and killed in workplaces and on construction sites. And as an outcry from all those years building up to 1970, the OSHA law was adopted. Mm -hmm. And then in 1970, the law became in effect and it started enforcing, issuing citations for whenever things were not up to code by the rules that were adopted by the OSHA standards. Mm -hmm. Explain how OSHA functions. Obviously, it is it is in Washington, part of the Labor Department, mm -hmm. and so how then does it filter down to a state like Kentucky? Well, uh, you have to have a federal agency in order to be able to direct a plan like that, just like you do with the EPA, the FDA, you know, all these other different regulatory groups. But the federal OSHA plan said that if a state wishes to have its own plan that they may do so with, with some provisions. And the provisions are is they have to be as good as or better than the federal plan. And what that means is, is the Code of Federal Regulations, the 29 CFR that governs OSHA and where that was adopted, the state has to enforce all the laws that the feds have on their books. But now the feds also said you could be better than our program and you may adopt laws over and beyond what we have on our books. And the state of Kentucky has chose to do that. And the state of Kentucky has a fair amount of extra regular re regulations over and beyond what the feds do. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, I believe, that about half the states have state programs in the it, country. It balances this out. It may be 24, 26, 25, 25, but it's pretty close to half. And, and right around in our area, uh, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee are state plan OSHA plants, but the states around us outside of that are all federally run uh, OSHA plants. Mm -hmm. Well, getting back to your career, 25 years, what exactly did you do as a compliance officer? How, how, how did your job function? Well, my task pretty much was to go out and conduct audits or safety inspections, health inspections, so forth, of workplaces to see if they we're in compliance with the regulations to identify hazards and to see what the hazards need to be to correct it so no one would get hurt at the workplace. The unfortunate part of being a compliance officer, uh, whenever you see things, it always usually came with a citation and penalty along with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's another agency in OSHA called Education and Training in state OSHA that if an employer asked them to come to their job site for an audit, there are no citations or penalties with them. But I was on the compliance side for 25 and a half years, and whenever I went to the door, it was I was there to enforce the law because of what wasn't being done. Mm -hmm. Without uh, naming any specific industries or businesses, what are some of, the, some of the worst things you saw in terms of safety hazards to workers around the state? Well, we could probably do an eight-day show on that, some of the worst things I saw. My first fatality investigation broke me in pretty good. Uh, it was a young man that was just above, I think he was 21 to 22 years old. 
and it was in a sawmill. <clears throat> it was a Saturday morning, and he wasn't paying real close attention to what he was doing. They was going to work a half a day, and he didn't realize that whenever he turned the big blade on, which is like a 55-inch blade or whatever, that there was some wood wedged in between the table and the blade. And whenever he saw that, I think what happened was he was afraid he, it was a wood mill. He was afraid a spark would occur and it would burn the mill down. So instead of just turning off the blade and letting it coast down, he tried to reach down and flick it. When it did, it pulled him in and it decapitated his head. And that was my first fatality investigation. And they were all doozies pretty much from that point on. I've, uh, in my career, I had, I think, I, and I may still have the state record for the highest fall uh, fatality. A young man that was about the same age fell off a cell phone tower 380 feet to his death. I had multiple trench fatalities, electrocutions, fall hazards, you know, caught in machines. It was just a lot of different things that, uh, I did a total of 75 fatality investigations in my career with a total of 77 deaths. And, uh, that's a very unfortunate thing because I don't really think if you were to go back and analyze the fatalities that I did, you could probably take five seconds of prevention and have stopped every one of them. Mm. That's grim. That's grim. You had some statistics about uh, before OSHA came in, how many fatalities. And of course, I talk about that in my classes about the chemicals that people were exposed to. Machines had no, no safety devices on them and all people lost hands and feet literally lost life and limb in, in, in these factories. Uh, you, did you find the job gratifying that, that maybe you, you go to a place and you prevent something like that from happening again? Yeah, you know, you, you got to feel satisfied in knowing that, that people are going home with their 10 fingers and their 10 toes and their lungs and everything in place. That's what the law is supposed to do. It is supposed to provide an employee the ability to be whole and not be injured. <clears throat> and that's a and that is the main focus of the law is to protect employees and a lot of times it, and it some employers view OSHA negatively but some employers actually embrace OSHA because they know those laws are there and if they if they work with those laws and they're promoting a safe workplace they're not having any injuries and their mod rate is staying low their workers comp is staying low and they're operating more efficiently mm -hmm. Did OSHA generate a lot of interest in industry and safety committees and things to get workers involved? I know, I know some of the plants at Calvert City have got committees where workers and management get together and work. Did, did OSHA stimulate a fair bit of that? Well, there's really not a law that says that has to be done, but it's always a good thing to do. You know, it would be a voluntary thing to do. Well, what I meant was, did, did OSHA stimulate interest in doing something like that? Oh, sort yeah, of they, they, definitely, they definitely stimulated the interest. Let's just say if OSHA was never adopted, would those committees exist? I think there would be a lot less of them if OSHA was not a regulation. Right, right, right. Well, the, 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 of course, 1970, the law was passed. Uh, uh, President Nixon signed it. It was the Williams-Steiger Act. Uh, who were Williams and Steiger? Well, they were just people in Congress that put the law together. You know, and one was a Republican and one was a Democrat, and they merged together with their ideas to come up with this new um, OSHA standard. And it was obviously bipartisan. I mean, President yeah. Nixon being a Republican, at that time the Congress would have been Democratic, and so it had, it had strong bipartisan support. Yeah, uh, and it was recognized it was time to do something about stopping people from getting hurt. And right, right. Now your background, did you, you went to Murray State and studied through the safety program over there? Yes, I did. I earned my bachelor's and my master's at Murray State in occupational safety and health. Uh, tell us about that curriculum. I mean, that's, uh, that's something that, well, when I went to Murray, they didn't have that. That was pretty much the old standard courses. How did Murray come about at getting, getting that degree? Do you know? You know, I don't really know how it started. I came into it the second semester after it started. I was going to say, look to me ago. about the time you were in on the ground floor. Yeah, I was pretty much in on the ground floor. Um, I was searching for a major, had done change majors three times, and was searching for my fourth well, one. Well, a lot of students do that. <laughs> a lot of students you know, do that. And I heard about this OSHA program, and I, was, and I was actually working in a steel mill that I felt was very unsafe. I worked my way through college on second shift. And I'd heard about this OSHA program. I thought, well, I'm going to check this out. So I took some classes. I thought, this is a place for me to be. So I just more or less declared my major in OSHA. And in, in uh, 83, I finished my bachelor's degree. 
And back then, we was in a pretty hard recession then at that time. Yes. And um, there was only two job options that I had. One was go to work in Los Angeles, and the other one was go to work for OSHA. And the, the gentleman that offered me the job in Los Angeles says, and he said, I can't pay you enough. He said, you know, maybe you need to think about taking the OSHA job, get a little experience under your belt and call me up in two years and we'll hire you then and pay you some more money. Well, I started with OSHA and I never, never even gave it a thought again. I, mm -hmm. I thought, well, this is a pretty good job and, and uh, I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the travel and getting out and meeting people and the training and so forth. And so I stayed 25 and a half years. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty good, pretty good haul. Uh, you're talking about uh, penalties uh, for non-compliance. So if you're a non-compliant industry, how much will it cost you to be non-compliant? Well, whenever OSHA first started, the penalty range was a dollar to a thousand dollars, and that a dollar from a dollar to a thousand dollars for what serious would, violations. What, I was going to say for, for a dollar. I mean, what would you what would you well, do? For, I can't even remember what those were now. It's yeah. been such a long time ago. Yeah. But it in in um, George Herbert Bush, the first Bush president, he raised that from a thousand dollars to seven thousand dollars, and then they put in some different calculation numbers in there as far as how you formulate good faith and history and so forth. And then just recently those penalties were were maintained at that same level but reformulated. And now the penalties uh, were are showing an increase of 50 to 60 percent over what they were before October mm -hmm. 1st. But uh, the, as far as the way the penalties work, uh, if you see something that's serious in nature, it has a penalty. If it's other than serious, like if it's something that won't hurt somebody, but it's still a regulation that says you need to do this, it almost always uh, will never carry a penalty at that point. If it carries a penalty, it's a very small penalty, like $125, $200. But for serious infractions, like for cave-ins, falls, and things like that, you know, probably $5,000 would be the average uh, where the calculation would begin. But now today, that 5,000 number has been moved to $7,000. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and the formulary of calculating the penalty has been adjusted where it makes the penalty more as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a, a Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA. Yes. Is that related to OSHA in any way? No, they're two separate, two separate groups altogether. But now they are both in the Department of Labor, I understand, right. on the federal right. level. Right, right, right. And of course, coal mining is one of the most dangerous occupations ever. And, um, and OSHA does do, does have jurisdiction on coal mine property. Now, what they do is, is, is if they have buildings, maintenance shops and things on the grounds, OSHA has coverage. But whenever you cut the ground, you either go on a pit down in a mine, open mine, or you cut the ground, you go in the mine through a, through a mountain, that's where OSHA stops. MSHA solely has that jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Is MSHA older than OSHA? I believe it is. Yeah, yeah. I wondered, I wondered about that too. Uh, also, county attorneys have the power to to enforce uh, safety at the local level. I didn't know that. No, it's it's not it's not the county attorneys have the power, but you know, there's been a lot of talk about deregulation. Oh, sorry, I misread that. Do not have the power. Okay. Yeah, and and we've we've have some people <coughs> now that. Uh, that are in favor of deregulation and bringing regulations to be enforced at the local level. And what I meant by that is, is, you know, if you have 120 counties and every county attorney is trying to enforce OSHA laws and EPA laws and MSHA laws, it's chaotic. It's more than what they can handle and a whole lot more staff and than, than, what, than what they could even manage in order to make the job. And it increases the burden of the number of people by having each individual county administer those laws. So it's better off that whenever the, the, it's either at the federal level or at the state level, you get more uniformity, and then plus your standards and things are adopted at that level in the mm -hmm. first place. So, more uniform. Yeah. Right. It makes it all uniform. Right. Well, in Kentucky, what is the hierarchy? Who is the head of the Kentucky OSHA? Your, is your dad? Well, the Secretary of Labor is the person that is the head of, of OSHA in Kentucky. Uh, ultimately, the governor is. Well, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so, but uh, as far as the person who runs the day-to-day the -day operation that's in charge, that is housed, OSHA's housed under the Labor Cabinet, 
and the labor secretary is the one who more or less is responsible for it. How many inspectors are there in Kentucky? It will range anywhere probably from 42 to 52, depends on retirements and you know just different things. In your opinion, is that adequate? No, it's nowhere near adequate. They could make that four times more and still never cover the industries in this state. In a, uh, so to, to hire more, that would require an act of the legislature, I guess? Well, funding would be an issue yeah. first, and you yeah. know, you'd have to get your funding from the legislature. Yeah, yeah. So there are roughly 50 of you all covering 120 counties in a state that's several hundred miles across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now typically then, you, you said you lived in Benton all during your career. Um, so when you were called out, would you be called out on one instant or multiple instance? In other words, would you ride a circuit or how did, how did you do that? Well, that, has, that, that could have worked several different ways. Uh, <clears throat> if I was out doing what they call just general planned inspections, I would just plan a route and I would probably leave on Monday and come back on Friday and just go do as many inspections as I could, come back the next week and write the reports, hopefully without any interruptions. But, you know, if, if you get a call for an intimate danger and people are working on a cell phone tower without being uh, tied off, that's when you drop everything. Right. Because with an intimate danger, you're there trying to stop someone from being seriously hurt or injured. Mm -hmm. And then you get calls for fatalities. You know, you've got to go respond because someone's been hurt or, you know, or killed at a job site. And uh, that's your second highest priority. And then you also have employee complaint inspections where employees have the right to file a complaint with OSHA and then you take the complaint and you go to the job site or the workplace, the manufactured site, and you just check those items to see if they are in violation or if they're not. And then you have follow-up inspections to go back to check the employer to see if they did correct things. And that's whenever you start looking at the repeat violations, the willful violations, and a lot of different things come into play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how does Kentucky rank with other states to the best of your knowledge in compliance? Are we good or bad or in between? Oh, I think Kentucky probably exceeds virtually all the states. Uh, this, there's probably, California's probably the top state as far as administering its OSHA program. But I, I think the Kentucky OSHA program is administered fairly well. And, um, and I believe that uh, it exceeds every state program in the United States, and I believe the feds would tell you that fairly quickly, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's good to see we're good at something. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not <laughs> often good at too many things. Not 49th or 50 and everything. Well, no, that, that's, that's good to know. Um, you also mentioned that, that, uh, the, the, uh, that regulations come from consensus regulations that are developed by uh, groups like the American National Standards Institute, the National Fire Protection Association, and so on. How do they come up with those standards, groups like that? Well, they're, they're, organiza they're organizational groups that recognize that standards need to be developed. As technology grows, you know, we have hazards and we have things that we have to, you know, take care of and, 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 and uh, make sure people aren't getting hurt. You know, the for unfortunate part of OSHA a lot of times is, is we're still enforcing old rules from the 50s and 60s that we adopted that we have not updated. But we have these ANSIs and things that employers in construction and in manufacturing can go purchase the latest ANSI, and if they want to do now, better, what's an ANSI? American National Standards Institute. Ah, that's a that's a group. That's a consensus group that adopt, that adopts standards. But if an employer wants to do more than what's in the OSHA book, the OSHA regulation book, and they want to be better, it's a best practice for them to go get an ANSI and comply with that ANSI because they're far exceeding what's in that regulation book. Mm. And so a lot of employers voluntarily want to do more than what the book says. And that's what ANSI, NFPA, NEC, all those different consensus groups do. <clears throat> they develop these standards and they also hope that OSHA will adopt their standards and implement those standards at some point. Does OSHA usually do that? OSHA does adopt a lot of their standards. Mm -hmm. With different groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, in in uh, well, again, this institute, the American National Standards Institute. How does that work? Do, it, it, do they represent certain industries, and they get input from the industries, or? Yeah, what they'll do is uh, they'll have different sectors come in, and they'll talk about. Well, we we think we need regulations to to guide this part of the machine that mm -hmm. we've never had before. 
this is a brand new development and we don't have any regulations for this. So they'll start doing the research. Well, what do those regulations need to be? You know, where, where, where do they need to go? And, and what are they, how are they gonna function? You know, and that's what those groups do and they start a study. And that study could go on for, for five years before they actually come out with a consensus standard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, again, you know, you think of the, the rapid increase in technology. Uh, I don't know, there was, several years ago, there was the, the, the problem of the, the uh, carpal tunnel syndrome from, from typing on the, well, I should keyboarding, I guess is the right word, on computers. I've just dated myself saying typing. But things like that that were sort of unanticipated. Well, you go back to OSHA in 1970, there were no personal computers in 1970. No. So, so, uh, so they have to d indeed uh, uh, adapt to things like that as well. Well, OSHA has to adapt just like everybody else does to technology and everything else. But at the same time, they have to look at the need for standards as we adapt in order to you know, help people. You know, we had an ergonomic standard that went into a place at the end of Bill Clinton's administration, and within a few days after George Bush came in, he more or less, uh, by executive order, removed that. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, we didn't have the ergonomic standard anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in the time we have left, tell us a little about your business, uh, a, a safety consultant. How does one consult about safety? Well, I tell you, I've been very blessed and very fortunate. Uh, whenever I retired, uh, I just started my own safety and health consulting firm and uh, didn't know how that was going to go because I didn't know how much I wanted to work. You know, whenever you retire, you, you start wondering, uh, do I just want one or two clients or how busy do I want to be? And, and then within like six months, I, I was covered up. And I've been very blessed ever since. I pretty much stay covered up all the time. Um, I help a lot of employers with several different things. For one, I help them with their abatement issues on how to correct things. Because, you know, throwing money at something is not always the right way to correct something. You know, there may be simpler ways to correct things other than to just throw a pot full of money at it, you know. And they don't understand that. That's what their first resolve is. Well, we'll just get it done no matter what it costs and they don't see all the different avenues. Well, I've got all these years in history of seeing manufactured facilities, construction sites, and I kind of know what works best in some places that maybe you haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's an avenue. Um, I do a lot of expert witness work for several law firms in defendant work and plaintiff work and uh, have a lot of contractor relationships, helping them with their stuff and training. And uh, things have gone very well. I've been very blessed and for the economy to be the way it's been this last two years, I, I just feel very uh, fortunate that uh, things have gone as well as I have. Mm -hmm. So got a website and I send my CV out to people for work and, and I usually get two or three calls a week for people needing something and go mm -hmm. out and help them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you see as the future of OSHA? Um, obviously there are two philosophies of government. One is that uh, more federal oriented, the other more state oriented. How does that affect OSHA pol politically? Obviously again, OSHA was created Bipartisan Democrats and Republicans got together on it, but OSHA's fortunes seem to swing back and forth. You know, w with political tides. Yeah. Uh, any any prediction on the future of OSHA? Well, I think OSHA will always be around. I don't ever see OSHA being like done away with or ever being just demolished. Um, anytime you have changes in administration, the OSHA program is going to be implemented differently. And regardless of your political party affiliation or whatever, the, the, some people, whenever they're in office, they're a little less stringent with the OSHA laws. But then whenever we change and we have a, a different philosophy, they get a little rougher or a little more, in, they enforce it more, you know. So um, we just went through a phase where we called OSHA the much kinder, gentler OSHA under the previous administration on the federal level. Oh, don't think we're using that term under this per current administration because the, they are actually enforcing the law to the way it's supposed to be enforced and they're not using that much kinder, gentler, you know, approach. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, and that there's good and bad to both sides of that. There always will be. But I, but I do feel that OSHA will always adopt new standards and they always will move forward. And if employers will just take an objective look 
at the standards instead of a negative look, they could see that if they comply with these things, that it's going to save them money. Because whenever someone gets hurt, it costs them a whole lot more than just that penalty. It costs them their workers' comp rate, their mod rate. It costs them employee morale. There's just a lot of things that happens whenever a person gets injured or killed at the workplace that it makes it hard for that employer to overcome. And if they would just adopt a philosophy is, this is what the book says we should do, let's do it, and then let's not, then our goal should be have no injuries. Mm -hmm. And I think that we'd all be better off. Mm -hmm. Is there also a, uh, a state safety committee organization uh, for industry? I think Benny Adair, you know, our friend Benny Adair has been involved in that. You talk about the Kentucky Safety and Health Network? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm on that board. Yeah, I thought you were. Do, does, do they work hand in glove with, with OSHA? Well, it's not that they work hand in glove with OSHA, but they they actually put on an annual conference right. every year, and OSHA right. is part of that conference. Right. That conference, the the board is made up of of education, management, labor, and government. And I sit on the business side of the board, and uh, they all come together and they meet once a month to decide what the next conference is going to be, what the courses are are going to be offered. So employers can send their representatives, labor representatives, the employers send their labor union representatives if they have a bargaining group to these meetings so they can learn and bring it back to the workplace what they've learned to, to be better employers and be safe, be safer. And that of course would help OSHA in raising safety awareness and exactly. maybe head off some things you might have to deal with later. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, there's always OSHA inspectors there that they can ask and talk to and ask questions and stuff, too, if they know them. A lot of these employers have had previous contact with OSHA compliance officers at their workplace, and then they see them at these conferences. Right, 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 right. So so you are, what we call you, semi-retired? or uh, Well, I'm, I'm retired, but I'm working, I think, twice as much as what I was whenever I was with OSHA. <laughs> so constantly on the road and working about 10 to 14 hours a day. But I guess I'll either... Keep you young or kill you. It's kind well, of uh, or a combination. Or a combination thereof. So <laughs> we're out of time. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. My guest today was Randy Gray. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.